I guess this first question is, is technically for the regulars. If I say, where do you go to church? And, you, and, and for the guests, I would say, where, where are you seated this morning? And the answer for all of us would be the Church of Christ at Alexandria. What's in a name? And you've seen this graphic, bulletins, newsletters, uh, these great jackets you see it. You know, Church of Christ, top line, large font, at Alexandria, smaller font, by design. Now, if I say, I go to the Church of Christ at Alexandria, I think, and, and I think I'm correct, that's capital C, that's proper name. Kevin Hall, the Ohio State University. But if I say, and I, this is equally correct, I attend a Church of Christ, the one that happens to meet in Alexandria, Ohio, that's a small c, church. What, if anything, is the difference? There is a difference between <clears throat> the church and a church. The church. Uh, technically, it's still printed with a lowercase c in, in the scriptures. That The church is referring to all of Christendom, all the Christians for all time, past, present, worldwide, etc. Uh, Jesus saying in Matthew 16, 18, you know, on this rock, I will build my church. Lowercase c, but it, but it still means all of us. Uh, the teachings that we had for husbands and wives in Ephesians 5, 23, this is Christ as the head of the church. You know, lowercase c, but it still means all of us. You and I are, we're all part of Christ church or Christ body. But the same word church in, in, in the Bible and in our conversations can also mean a, a local body of believers um, gathering together. We're meeting in a specific place, a certain geographical or physical area. Um, some examples, 1 Corinthians seven seventeen says, Nevertheless, each one should retain the place in life that the Lord assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is a rule I lay down in all the churches. Local body. Galatians 1. One and two. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers with me to the churches in Galatia, to all the churches in this state or province or local area. First Corinthians sixteen nineteen. The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord. And so does the church that meets at their house. So we're, this is both and. The church and this church, and we're finishing up this week, we're finishing up these series of these four doctrinal distinctives. We're, we're looking at what the Bible says, how do we apply it, how do we teach it, how do we share it, and, and part of that is how, did we, how do we set up our church? What, what is our structure, uh, the organization, is there any hierarchy, church polity it's called? Because you start looking around, and I think most of us say, uh, we're different from most of the other churches in this regard. Uh, first, we'll spend most of our time here. Other, other churches have hierarchies. Why don't we? And what, what happens if you, uh, you are dissatisfied with your weight service or, or uh, the food you got? You, you, you ordered, I don't know, chicken nuggets and a salad, and they bring you a chocolate shake with tin hairs in it and fries that are covered with snot. You know, what are you going to say? I'd like to speak to the manager. You know, can I speak to someone, someone in charge? How far up the ladder do I need to go? And, and if you were to ask here, I'd say, well, you could go to Mark Kaiser. You could ask Bob Strong. You know, they're the elders of our congregation. And, and if you don't like the answer they give you, if you, you say, well, I want to talk to your supervisor, don't come to me. You know, because I listen to them. And there's nothing, and that's, a, that's different from a lot of churches, from, from a lot of faith groups. Um, in the Catholic Church, a local question might go to, to the priest, and then maybe to the bishop, or to the archbishop, maybe the cardinals, even the pope. There's a, there's a place to go. Um, a different, defini- different denominations have synods, sessions, presbyter- presbyteries, conferences, councils, superintendents, that there are layers of structure or organization that, that's over and above just the local church body. And, and, and we don't have that. And there, there, there's no denying that there was a meeting in Acts chapter 15. If you want to turn with me in your New Testament to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, uh, page 923 in these Black Pew Bibles, the council in Jerusalem. And this is the book, obviously this is the book of Acts. This is the earliest record of 
the church, founding generation. Peter, Andrew, James, John, Mary, Martha, Paul, they're, they're all still there, all still alive and in the mix. And at this point, by chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas have now gone out and they've completed what we'll call their first missionary journey. And they've been out and they've been teaching Gentiles, they've been teaching non-Jewish people, hey, you can be Christians too. And now some, some of the Jewish Christians, some with Jewish descent, they come along behind them and they keep on saying, and we want to add this, you got to do this too, do this and this. And Acts 15.1 Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So there's where it starts. And if the local people had realized Paul has the same authority as the apostles, they would have never gone and taken the time and the energy, but that's that's just kind of human nature. We, We don't like that guy's answer. Can, can we go to a higher court, so to speak? You know, Jesus struggled with the same thing in his hometown in Nazareth. They looked at him and went, oh, this is Joseph's kid. You know, really? Him? You know? and, and Paul and Barnabas are wise. They basically say, look, if you don't accept our teaching on this, why don't we go to Jerusalem and, and see the apostles, and we'll ask them. So, again, verse 2. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way. As they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. Verse 6, the apostles and elders met to consider this question. So they're going to have a meeting, right? They're going to have a discussion. Ah, It says debate in the ESV, and it's back and forth it goes. And in the midst of that meeting, Peter will stand up and he'll say, I'll I'll give you my position on this. I I believe that all the Gentiles should be welcomed in. Uh, You know how the Lord spoke to me. This is what I've experienced. Uh, James, likewise, will speak up and he'll say, I think this is in in agreement with Scripture. And he gives their Scripture, our Old Testament, and he says, this this is my judgment. Let's just make minimal recommendations, uh, verse 19, 20, etc. That seems good to everybody that's involved. Um, A letter is drafted. It's signed, and witnesses from this council are selected. And you're going to go back with both parties. And we're going to go back to Antioch. And now verse 30, Acts 15, 30. The men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. I don't, I don't have any argument with the idea that this is a reality. They had a disagreement that was settled by, shall you say, a higher court. But the question that we have for churches today is, if if they did that in Acts 15, why don't your churches of Christ and Christian churches do that today? What's different? And we would respond and say, see, they have a unique need here. Okay, They're in a time and a setting. They don't have, in that time, this complete, full word of God to guide them. They, they don't have a concordance. They, they can't look on the shelf and look up in the concordance how many times that word's been used in the Bible. They don't have commentaries that they can reference. Uh, they don't have version on their phone where they can you know, look at four or five different translations and compare. If they, if they want an answer, they've got to go see the apostles. And, and if, you were to come, if you come to me, uh, you come to Mark, you come to Bob, you come to any leader, a teacher, I would, I would hope if you came to anybody in this church... And you had a question, and they said, how does, how does your church feel about X? I would hope that any of us would start with, well, what does the Bible say about that? Let's look here. And we have a complete, perfect, 1 Corinthians 13, the written, compiled will of God. I have a source here that was not yet available in Antioch or even Jerusalem in 50 AD. It's just like you, you're something wrong with your car. You know, your, your Ford breaks down, what do you do? You go in the glove box, wherever you keep the owner's manual, and you look it up, and you have that whole manual. I don't know what they did in 1903 when the first Fords were rolling off the line. I don't know how thick that manual was, if, if there was one. And you know there were things that hadn't been discussed yet, and you know what they said. Go ask Henry. <laughs> he, he built this thing. Let's figure out what's wrong with it. And that, Now, none of this, is, that's not to say that we never seek help beyond these four walls. Right? There, there have been numerous times I've gone to 
fellow preachers, mentors, my parents, trusted leaders. And we do have like a preacher's group that meets every month. And the, some guys joked, and I don't, I don't think he thought it was very funny, but if you know Ray Lynn, Ray was at that time serving, and he was kind of the elder statesman, the longest tenured, uh, oldest experience. And so some guys would joke and call him the Bishop of Licking County. You know, and he never laughed. <laughs> you know, and and I, I didn't say it. It's just the idea that, you know, there's somebody, and there's nothing wrong with going to somebody that has more experience, older, wiser counsel, so long as what? So long as the, the Ray Lynn's or, or the Steve White's or the Linda Hall's or whoever I'm asking, they answer my question with, well, the Bible says this. You know, or, or did you forget about this passage? How about we look up here? Oh, yeah. And I, I don't doubt for a minute that most of any other church of any other design, they would say that's exactly what we do. It might be a little more streamlined, it might be a little more formal and official, but what happens sometimes when, when you get things too structured? You know? And I'm studying for this sermon, and I came across an article, and this is from July of 2015, and there was this, that's the actual building of the church, uh, what denomination doesn't matter, but the church was growing exponentially in rural Pennsylvania and they went to the leadership of the conference, and they said, we, we want to leave. We're going to leave the denomination. Because the people from the church had come to them and said, we don't believe that the, in the seminary they're teaching the, from the text, from the Bible anymore. And then they started, and they said, what are we going to do if the, the higher-ups don't use the Bible? And, and so the local congregation said, we're, we're going to leave. Well, okay, but what's at issue here is the $4 million mortgage at that time that they had on this huge building out in rural Pennsylvania. Because the church said, we'll take it. We'll take it all with us. And back and forth went the negotiations, and and finally the conference said, all right, we'll sell you the building for $100,000 and 58 acres for $100,000, and you take it, and you go on your way. As long as you give your apportionments to the district of $58,000, We'll release you, and you can have the building and everything. And, of course, some of the folks were like, why would we do that? And and the the bishop, she said, look, I tried to get them to stay, but they're not going to stay. And if they leave and we keep the building, she said, we're going to be saddled with a $4 million mortgage out in the country in Pennsylvania. We can't pay that. And and as I read through, and the whole article goes, you know, down back and forth of all the conversations and and this, is this going to be a precedent, and what are we going to do next time? And I just kept reading obligations, conference, book of discipline, negotiation, resolution, just all of that, 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 that all seems to me to be superstructure from the organization of the New Testament, the local church, where you have elders in each congregation, and that's the extent of it. You know, and I'm, I'm sure none of that type of situation was ever the original design of, of any other group. You know, that's not where they started. But what happens? Something gets started, and it takes root, and it starts to grow, and it becomes more powerful. And it takes on a life of its own. Washington, D.C. comes to mind. You want to talk about big government. Do you know anybody that believes that maybe the government today is maybe a little bit beyond some of the bounds that the founding fathers had intended? Is it possible that there's some government official who might not have your or my best interests at heart and mostly it's just because they're, they're far too removed to know what happens right here in our local church. And, and the same thing happens in, in the church bodies. You know, all, all of these sexual abuse scandals, all of these leaders that are being charged, men with varying levels of authority and responsibility, and how many times the local church, they sit and wait to see what somebody higher up is going to do, if they're going to do in response, and it become very disheartening to be forced to follow a leadership you don't trust and that you can't remove. And I looked up some of the reasons. I said, where did this begin? How, did, how do you see this continuing through history? And, and they pointed me to this, 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. This is Paul writing. You then, my son obviously right in Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. And they'll say, see there, you can see right there in that verse, the first four generations, Paul, Timothy, reliable men, others. Chain, successions, meant to be. And the trouble with that is what? What happens when somebody that you had hoped was reliable isn't? 
or, or somebody that you thought was qualified ends up not being. You know, man looks on outward appearance. We make the best judgment we can. God looks at the heart. Sometimes it's tough to discern what's going on in the heart. And I'm not suggesting that nobody's going to say church leaders, officials of any stripe, need to be perfect. None of us are ever going to be that. Peter was a first-generation leader, and he got in trouble. First, this is Paul in Galatians 2.11. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. And I'm sure every church group would say, no, we don't expect our, our leaders or our officials to, to be perfect but we do expect that they function with the same authority and the same oversight as the Acts 15 council did. That, that has been passed down, that authority. And that's where we, Church of Christ, Christian Church, Restoration Movement, we, we feel differently. You know? Yes, there was a power, there was an authority, if you will, that the apostles had. When Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth. That's for them, that's temporary, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't get passed down. The ability to perform the miracles and heal the sick and raise the dead is temporary. They could pass it down one generation while the scripture is being assembled. You know, there was a time and a place for an Acts 15 oversight and leadership. But once you have the Bible, that ceases. And I I know it's difficult. Maybe one of the clearest examples I can give you is earlier in Acts, God's intent that this apostolic succession or the authority would be limited, look in Acts 6. Um, Acts 6, the apostles say, hey, we need help with this food thing. Remember that? that we're, we're preaching and teaching, and we can't oversee the food distribution too. So they say to the church, you guys pick seven men who you think you know are full of Holy Spirit, and we'll pass this ministry on to them. And they pick the seven guys, and you can see the names there in verse 5, uh, Stephen, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, that group. And then it says the apostles go, and they lay their hands on these guys, and they enable them to also perform miracles, because you can look in verse 8, a couple verses later, Acts 6, 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. That's the first time Luke notes somebody other than the apostles who's able to do this. It's been passed down one generation. And then if you go over to chapter 8, and Philip, who's also in that group of seven, he's the same, and he's doing the same thing. Now he's in Samaria, and People notice. He, he's doing these miracles. He, he's doing, and Simon the sorcerer notices, huh, that's, pretty, that's impressive. I know a trick when I see it. That's not one. And word gets back to Jerusalem, and Peter and John come, and they, in verse 17, they lay hands on some of these believers, and they pass that on to them, same gift. And Simon notices that. He goes, hey, I see where it comes from. Can I buy me some of that? And Peter and John say, no, that, that's not the point. You missed, you know, you missed a boat here. And I, and I say all that to say, why did Peter and John have to come? You know, if they could pass it on to Philip, and he's already in town, if, he, if it was intended to be passed on from generation to generation, he could have just done it himself. Save them the trip and the money. But that's not the intent. That's not the design. And by the time that generation and the next, those people died out and their miracles and their proofs and their signs, uh, the word is compiled and that need stops. What you'll find time and again, Acts 16, 17, to to the right of your Bible, is local churches, local bodies, local oversight, elders in the church. And that's why I I know I just left a little bit of space at the bottom, because some people might have some questions. They might say, so so you're saying you guys never never interact? Uh, No. (laughs) Two words, bean dinner. (laughs) We we, we just took the, the 20 guys... And there were, what did they say, 750 or some? I don't know how many churches, 50, 100, a bunch of churches. Uh, I picked out an image from Ohio Teens for Christ. Kids from the whole state gather there. There's a dark image from a concert at Summer in the Sun. Uh, truth be told, there's probably kids from Michigan there. And we fellowship with them like regular people. <laughs> you know, it's, that's part of it. Um, the missionaries that we support, of all our missionaries, we're, we're not what's called the living link or the sole provider for any of them. Uh, we, we have different missionaries that we meet with, and different other churches also support them, and we work together. Every local church and every missionary decides who they're going to work with and how they're going to support. Um, insecurities, uh, be it food, clothing, 
we partner with people trying to work on that. The food that you leave here in our building goes to the local food pantry. Uh, if you happen by the, the food pantry distribution, you might see Jared or Suzette or myself on a Thursday between 10 and 12, working with the other people, many of them from the, the Methodist church in town, trying to help provide we, we do have nationwide meetings. You could, in the past, you could go to the North American Christian Convention. Uh, they're changing that name to Spire this fall. Thousands of people. You can meet with thousands, but we're not going to have a, a big assembly and an overall vote. There's no binding decisions. Uh, we're not going to elect three delegates from the Church of Christ of Alexandria, and they went and they said, yeah, we all voted. The, all three of us voted against it because we're all against it, but overall, the, the measure passed 512 to 468, so we're going to have to do it even though we don't agree with it. We, we don't run into that. Um, I love to go to ICOM, International Conference on Missions, and I just there's a picture from before the thing started, and just worldwide, missionaries and churches, and you fellowship and interact and worship, and, and you can easily find folks to support, and, but nobody ever comes to us from outside and says, you have to give X amount of dollars to Y ministry. We're simply trying to restore the church the way it was in its incarnation in the first generation. No, no more oversight, no less. You know? And I tried, to, I tried to ask in my mind, is there any other question? And, and truth be told, this might be uh, the only question for some of you. Because I thought, this group, you're either going to fall into one or two groups. Either you're keenly interested in what I've been saying and why, or you really don't care and you've just kind of been zoned out the whole time going... Yeah, we're right, whatever you said, are you almost done? Because you know, I, I don't pay attention to that. I trust you. And my question was, somebody might ask this, do you even need me for any of this? Am I, does this, what do you need from me? I said, yes. We need you, all of us, in two huge ways. This does not matter your age. It does not matter your gender. It doesn't matter your background. We need everybody here. For two, two asks I have. One is I'm asking everybody here to be what I call a loyal Berean. I've talked about it. that's my favorite Sunday school class from my growing up church. It was, it was the old people's class, the loyal Bereans. And I, I keep thinking of my class downstairs. If there's no opposition, that's probably what I'll call us. Because you know who the Bereans were? They were the people who looked in their Bibles. This is Acts 17.11. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. You read your Bible. You. When you're in doubt, you study your Bible. If you don't know, feel free. Come to me, Daniel, Stephen, any of the guys, teachers, anybody in the church, parents, kids. But if and when they give you an answer... Check their answer against what you find in the Bible. Here is the Apostle Paul coming to this town, and he's preaching in his wisdom, and those people are checking the scriptures that they had available. I will, I will do everything I can in my power to never intentionally lead you astray from this word. But if you ever run into a situation out of my mouth or somebody, and, and there's something that is said or some change or something, and, and you... You feel that's counter to Scripture. Please feel free. You come into my office. You lay your Bible down on my desk. You say, tell me where you find that in this. And that's for all of us. Where, where are you getting that from the Bible? And I, I, don't, I don't know if that's my fear or my concern with, with some of the denominational battles. I don't know if some of the members have just become, it's, it's trusting. I don't want to say it's lazy. Would you ask one of your friends, where would you get that? Where does your church get that? Oh, we got that from headquarters. Where'd they get it? Oh, I'm sure they got it from the Bible. I trust them. I didn't look it up myself. Ownership. That's the other one. Please take ownership. Whose church is this? And the right answer is Jesus. And it's my church. And it's your church. I'm always puzzled when people who sit in these pews week after week, they come up to me and say, what are you guys doing up there at your church? I'm like, your church? It's our church. You sit here too. You know, it's all of our church. Please, do, please don't ask me how many keys I have handed out to this facility. Because it's a lot. You know, probably more than you think. And if you don't feel comfortable carrying a key, I can tell you where the key is hidden outside. You know, a lot of people know where that is. This isn't my church. You know, this is our church. Who, who typically takes better care 
of a vehicle or a home? The renters or the owners? All of us, ownership. And, and what is going to become, what this church is going to be able to do in the future, that remains to be seen. Yeah, I got ideas. Oh, I was good for a couple of ideas. But my ideas and the leader's ideas, and I'll meet with those guys today. We meet every month. It's expedient. You know, it's necessary. But in the end, what we're going to become, what we're going to do as disciples, that, that's not just five, six, seven guys in a room. That's all of us. You know, th- this is our church, and in some ways it is distinct from other churches out there. But we're just going to continue to strive that our distinctions are rooted in the Word of God. Let's pray and we'll close. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that endures and we just pray that we can handle it correctly and continue to understand and apply it consistently in our lives. Uh, Father, sometimes it's not the passages that we struggle to understand. It's the ones that we can so easily and readily figure out, but still they require a change or a sacrifice. And we pray that we would be willing to first and foremost to ground ourselves individually in your word, to be confident in our own ability to read and to know that just as long as we open ourselves up to your word, that your spirit can help us to understand and apply. Thank you for what has endured through the centuries and for all those who strive to just help make the church as as biblical as it possibly can be. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Continue to use this portion of our service each week to extend uh, an invitation, an opportunity. If you haven't made that initial decision, if you haven't been uh, immersed, this is your invitation. Sometimes folks have already made that decision and they will come and share and worship with us. Uh, Let's stand together this invitation just as I am.
all ages really are welcome. And we're going to try to get as many folks from the community as we can, but it's based on that we got those jars of marbles out there. You know, you have like 936 weeks from the time your child's born until they go to high school and what happens through those stages. And we're going to invite all the parents and the families. And it's probably 10, 20 minute video each night. And then I'd really love to have experienced, mature input from our group to say, yeah, this is what we've experienced. So um, if you can possibly be a part of one or all of those, it starts April 22nd. And I'm going to ask the chairs this morning to decide if we're going to do Psalm 100 or James 1. Heads will be Psalm 100 and tails will be James 1. No, my youth group tonight seven, and uh, we do need the final number I think for Teams for Christ tonight. So uh, we've got that's still a little bit up in the air. I mean, we have some for sure, but we have some question marks. Too. So if you're one of the question marks, please see me. And this was one of the Sundays where Daniel was scheduled to not be here. Right? He's not unconscious with the weight on his face. Yeah, he's as far as I know, he's still into his track meet yesterday. Yeah. So if you didn't get that email, <laughs> Daniel dropped a 45 pound weight on his face. And has stitches right, right there. Wow. So, but he, he's, and of course, being the parental images, you know, Steve's like, "Do you have a concussion?" Like, yeah, a little one. But look at the picture; it's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Seems I think he's doing well on Saturday. So keep it in prayer. And if you pray for us, appreciate it. Dear God, thank you so much uh, for this day, God, and thank you for each person here, God. And God, we thank you most of all for your Son uh, and for your Word, God. And God, we just pray. Uh, we pray for our leaders. Uh, we pray for members and our visitors and uh, that each of us, God, can uh, just uh, use the word that you've given us as, as the source, God, uh, and just please help us to uh, take time to use it, to read it, uh, and apply it to our lives. Uh, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's close this morning by saying, take the name of Jesus with you. <laughs>